Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 40. David's writing this, and he writes this after he wrote Psalm 39, which is all about David pleading with the Lord for mercy. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me, and the Lord, he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. He lifted me out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and place their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. No one can recount to you, were I to speak of them and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears, Lord, you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, as you know, Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For troubles without number, they surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, the Lord be exalted. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. Lord, you are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. Father, we come into your presence with expectation because you are the great God who saves and you have met us in this time. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us in truth, that we would be transformed by your word. And God, above all, I pray that you would increase, that I would decrease, that your word would go forth, and that your gospel would bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. David speaks of a slimy pit, a pit of mud and mire. When I think of a slimy pit, I think of this. Star Wars Day, uh, which I believe was yesterday. But when I think 
think of a slimy pit, that is exactly what comes to mind. I mean, the scene just prior to this, Luke was sucked under by that slimy alien looking thing, and that's the reason why his hair is wet, because he went totally under into the slimy pit. And you'll notice that these are the heroes of the story. I believe this is episode four, A New Hope, which means that they've got a couple more episodes of doing some really cool stuff, but at this moment in time, they are utterly helpless. They are stuck in this slimy pit, and unless <laughs> something else outside of their situation does something, they're done for. These heroes who repeatedly, throughout the trilogy, do amazing, remarkable things, they defy the odds constantly at this moment, are desperate for help. And I think this gives us a glimpse into David's heart, his situation. He feels as though the circumstances of his life are completely closing in on him. He says that my troubles are too many to number. He, he says, my sins, there's so many. All I see is my shame. All I see is everything that I have done wrong. And they have overtaken me to the point where I don't even feel as though I can see straight. And part of the reason why David recounts that is because David just got done a serious season of waiting. That's all that Psalm 39 is about. Uh, David waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord to deliver him. And so today when we gather together, as I said earlier, we need to acknowledge the reality that we gather together oftentimes as waiting worshipers. We're all probably waiting for something we might be waiting, as I said, for a, a job, some type of financial breakthrough, some type of medication to work out, the doctors to get something right. We come together waiting for something, and so often when we wait, we lean into the Lord, and we trust God, and we fix our eyes on Him, and we can have hope in the midst of the waiting because of the faithfulness of our Lord. So last week I gave you four R's, this week I'm giving you four T's. I don't know when I'm going to be done this alliteration kick, but it's working for right now. The first thing the psalmist does, that David does, is he places his trust in the Lord. And you'll notice that this is a recurring theme. I feel like every text that we dive into each week refers to trust. And, and this is a good thing, because we are saved by grace through faith, Faith meaning trust. Our trust is to be rightly placed in the person of God, in the character of God, and in the work of God. But the thing that we need to realize about trust is, is that trust is not just a one-time thing. It is not something where you say, God, I trust you one time. No, this is a present tense, always active sort of trust. It is a daily trust. And it is thus a daily decision, God, I place my trust in you. Which means that the trust is not automatic. You don't wake up every morning and say, oh yeah, I, I just feel like trusting God. No, it is a conscious decision and a daily choice. Trust is a choice. David says it himself, he says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And that word blessed can really be translated happy or rewarded. And the word trust can be translated as find security. So you can really read verse 4 like happy is the one who finds their security in God. Trust is a choice. And it results in contentment. Where even when we're in the midst of our waiting, we can rightly place our trust in God and find in Him all that we need to sustain us through that. I think it is so fascinating that Isaiah in chapter 40 says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That oftentimes we think of seasons of waiting as unproductive. But God views it differently. You see, when you wait on the Lord and when you trust in the Lord while you wait, your strength is not defeated. No, it's actually renewed. Now David does something in this text that he did last week as well. What he does is he looks backward, he looks to the present moment, and he looks forward 
to inform or to establish his trust. He looks at God's past activity first. He says, Lord, many are the wonders you have done. God, many are the things that you have done in my life and in the life of the Israelites. Lord, when I look back, I can see your faithfulness in my life. And then, then he says something really interesting. He said, I can't even count them all. They are too many to declare. God, when I look back at my life, I can see that you have come through for me each and every time. God, my trust is in you. I find it really interesting that whenever I preach these sermons, uh, I have to go through something that week to really allow the Lord to work on this in my own heart. I mean, literally just the other day, as I, as I was spending time with the Lord, I was reminded of His faithfulness, of how He helped me overcome a past obstacle so that I could allow that to inform my trust of my present obstacle. You see, when we look back, and we see all that the Lord has done. And we gaze upon God's faithfulness in the rearview mirror. What it does is it brings us to a place of awe. It brings us to a place of worship. When our words can no longer capture the greatness and the grandeur of the God who has sustained us to this very day. But David doesn't live in his past. He doesn't stop there. But then he allows his past activity to inform his present trust, and he blurts out this expression of praise. He says, Lord, there is none like you. He says, God, none compares to you. When I look back, God, at your past faithfulness, none compares with you. And when we think about that concept of no one comparing with God, that is really gets at the crux of what the word holy means. Holy means set apart. It means that God is infinitely different. That God is in a league of his own. That there is no one else like him. And so when David is looking at his past, he's saying, God, there is no one like you. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are set apart. And because, God, of who you are in this present moment, I will trust you for my future. Then he makes a statement in verse 5 about his future. He says, God, many are the things you have planned for us. Friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, I, I want you to take that passage personally. Many are the plans he has for me. Because when you know that God is not far off, he is not aloof, he is not distant, but he is a present God who meets you in this very moment and that he has many, many, many thoughts about you personally, it's not selfish to believe that. This is what your God is like. When you look at his past faithfulness, his present character, his future goodness, we can delight in the truth that what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived are the great things that God has in store for those who love him. What we've been doing in this series is we've been taking a look at why do we gather together, right? Why, why do we do the things that we do when we gather together corporately each week? Well, why do we do this? Why do we take an hour out of our week on Sunday morning? What is the purpose for this? Why do we do what we do? Well, one of the main reasons why we do this is because when we gather together corporately, we allow the truth of God to inform our daily trust of God. That's why we sing. That's why we sang, Blessed be your name. And if, if you'll notice, uh, there's two parts to each of those verses. There's a positive part and a negative part. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the wilderness, right? Negative. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, positive. But the common theme is, Lord, blessed be your name. We inform the truth. We, we allow the truth of God to inform our present trust. That's why we read the scriptures. That's why I preach that the truth of God would become alive in our hearts, that we would know that God is indeed trustworthy. That in the variety of things that we come into this place with, we can place our trust personally in this personal God. 
So we trust Him. And when you come to trust the Lord, and you find Him to be abundantly trustworthy, the natural thing that you do next is, is that you turn to Him, and you ask. Jesus is constantly saying, ask and you shall receive. Right? And, and, and it's an, a present imperative that he says there. It, what it really means is keep on asking. Jesus is saying keep on asking. Keep on knocking and the door will open to you. So when we gather in this place, what we are doing, not only personally, but collectively, corporately, is that we are all turning to God together. That's why we pray. That's how we, why we have that moment of corporate prayer. It's not just the time to sit back and listen to a song. It's a time to turn to God and to ask. And when we ask, just as David does, we're to ask while being honest about the reality of our lives. I mean, listen to what David says here. He says, for troubles without number surround me. Are you here today and you have troubles without number that surround me? It says, my sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. He's essentially saying, I can't even get out of bed. All I keep thinking about is everything that I've done wrong in my life. Mm -hmm. he, he says, my sins are so great, they're actually more than the hairs on my head. And he says, my heart fails within me. He comes to this place of deep discouragement. You'll notice, and I said it last week, and I'll say it again, and it's a common theme throughout the Psalms, so we'll probably hit it a couple more times before we're done this series, is that the Psalms are tremendously honest. The Bible never shies away from the reality of pain and suffering. No, it is very clearly expressed. And this is what David is doing here. He's showing the true nature of his reality. He's saying, God, I'm in a slimy pit. I'm caught up in the mud and the mire. I'm being realistic about my situation. I'm not going to come into your presence and try to hide what is actually going on. No, I'm, Lord, I'm coming into your presence. And I'm going to seek you for who you are, knowing that you hear me and knowing that you care for me. I think it's even more intense here, as if the last one wasn't enough. He says, may all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. You see what he's doing here? He's being re real even about the anger that he feels towards other people. He acknowledges the reality that there are people in his life who are wishing his ruin. There are people in his life that are hoping, wishing that he was dead. <coughs> and David doesn't just bottle that up. What he does is he comes into the presence of the holy, perfect, most high God. And he says, God, this is the reality of what I'm feeling. Would you help me deal with this? Would you restore to me the joy of my salvation? He comes with honesty. And because he comes with honesty, he also comes with confidence. You'll notice what he says. He says, Lord, do not withhold your mercy from me. God, I am, I am desperate for your mercy. God, I need you to come through here. God, if you do not come through, I've got nothing. You see, David prayed that confidently because he knew that the Lord was merciful. He had seen many, many, many times in his life before where the Lord had been merciful, how the Lord had redeemed him, how the Lord had saved him. And yet he comes back to this place of constant dependence on God and declares confidently, Lord, do not keep your mercy from me. And I love the urgency of David. Come quickly, Lord. Come quick. Do not delay, God. Come quickly, to me. I need your mercy. And, and when I look at David, how he's praying here, how he's processing things before God, it, it has the urgency of Luke crying out to C-3PO. C-3PO! Help me! There's an urgency here. If you do not pull through, I'm going to get smushed. Lord, I need you to show up. And, and I, I just want to ask, is that what your prayer life is like? Is, is it that confident? Is, that, is it that urgent? 
Is it that dependent? Is it that honest and real? Or is it just kind of, you know, God, I hope you pull through. I, I hope you do something. This is why we gather together. Because we do not gather together oftentimes from a position of strength. We come together oftentimes from a position of weakness. But we have a God and we have a community that meets us in the midst of our weakness. And what we see is that we find that the Lord restores our strength and gives us confident hope. A couple weeks ago at Easter, we gave out these books, the Banding Together books. And in the beginning, there's a Bible reading plan. And it's just a, a great, it's about two, two chapters a day. Just a great opportunity to guide your meeting with God uh, each and every day. And there's also a, a journaling section so that after you read this segment for the day, that you journal about it. You write about what the Lord has done. And the, the cool thing is it provides a, a little bit of like a history book for your life because then you can more easily go back and say, hey, here's where I was on this day. Look at what God has done. We have already had people come in and say, God really showed up in my life. And all I did was start pursuing Him intentionally each and every day. We, we like to say that the Bible is our curriculum, that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And what we really mean by that is that you don't need to know me to receive teaching. The reality is, is that God can teach you right where you are. And this was the state of David's heart. He knew that he could trust God. He knew that he could turn to God. And what he was doing was he was actually anticipating transformation. That's your third T. So trust, turn, he was anticipating transformation. Friends, transformation happens when we go beyond the ritual and we get to the real thing. And what I mean by that is, is that we don't just do the practice. We don't just take communion. We don't just sing songs. We don't just read scripture. We don't just listen to preaching. No, we pursue God through these things. All these things are good and wonderful avenues for us to receive the grace of God, but we don't just do the thing. We want God himself. We want to know him. Amen. You'll notice that David writes, sacrifice and offering you do not desire. Essentially, dry ritual means nothing to you, God. But my ears, you have opened. God, you have met with me personally. God, you have personally opened my eyes so that I could see your truth. God, I know that you are indeed the real, true God. And you have transformed me as a result. Now, the pathway to transformation requires, though, active trust in God's work. You'll notice that David says things repeatedly in this passage like, He lifted me out of the slimy pit. He set my feet on a solid rock. He put a new song in my mouth. He opened my eyes. David knew that he was totally and completely reliant on God's activity. That if God did not show up in his life, he was done for. So, I've got to ask, I'm asking myself this, as I wrestle with this text, do my prayers require God to actually show up? Do my prayers, are, are, they, are they big enough, are they bold enough that God actually has to show up? Or are they kind of safe prayers? Are they nice, pretty prayers, but not prayers that can transform my life and transform the lives of those around me? You see, when transformation happens, it bears fruit in your life. People can very clearly see that you have been transformed by God when you have. You see, he gives you a new heart. David says, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. You see, real transformation happens when you want to do what you ought to do. When you no longer start fighting God on stuff, when you stop fighting God and you say, no, God, I want to do your will. I want to do what you desire. I want to do what I ought to do. And when that happens, that is the fruit of transformation. He also gives a new song. 
David says, the Lord put a new song on my mouth. And I love the word new there. Because the reality is, is that when God works in your life personally, it's always a new thing. I'm not saying that he changes who he is. I'm not saying that he changes the truth. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is when God moves mightily in your life, there's a new song for you to sing because God has done something new and fresh in you. And, and I always thought that was kind of strange. Like, yeah, okay, David, you're just being poetic there. Uh, but again, the Lord is like making me live this out. I woke up yesterday morning literally singing a new song that I had never sung before. And at first I was like, this is kind of weird. What is this? But it's indicative of the truth that this is not just words on a page. That God indeed gives us a new song in our hearts, whether that is a literal song or it's something to proclaim about His goodness. You see, friends, worship of God is never something that is stale. Right? We do not worship a stale God we do not worship a God who is not moving, a God who is not active. We do not worship a boring God. We worship an almighty God who is worthy of all of our praise. And so David is saying, Lord, you've put a new song in my mouth because you truly are active, working mightily in me. But then he also gives not only a new song, but a new mission. He says, many will see and fear and put their trust in God. And so I ask you today, if, if you've been transformed by the person and work of Jesus Christ, who else is being transformed because of what God has done in you? You see, David was saying very clearly, this isn't just a personal thing. What God has done in me is not just for me. It's so that others would know the truth about who our God is. Amen. That's why we gather together. That's why we sing a new song. Or we might sing an old song in a new way. Because we want to have this fresh expression of praise to our God. And I think there's great things in that because all of a sudden it unleashes a natural God-given creativity in our worship. Because it's no longer a stale thing. We have been made new. And so we take part in God in God's mission of making all things new. The last T for you is tell. David told the story while he waited. David says something really interesting. He, he says, Lord, I do not seal my lips. I do not conceal the truth about who you are. No, Lord, I do not seal these things. I, I speak these things, even in the midst of my waiting, even though I have not overcome the mountain yet, I will proclaim your love, I will proclaim your faithfulness, I will proclaim your truth. So often, we're waiting for a breakthrough to start proclaiming about what God has done in our lives. David said, may that not be so. When we gather together, may we speak with one another about what God has done. Last week, you heard Diane's testimony. We heard John's testimony a few months before, and I'm looking forward to hearing more and more and more of those. I don't even think, I heard there was this thing called uh, testimony time or testifying back in the day. I'm thinking about bringing that back, because you don't need to hear me every time. God is working in your lives as well, and there is something powerful about hearing from others what God is doing. This is why we meet together. This is why when we come together, we, we come with expectation of God because God is always on the move. He is willing to change us. He is willing to make, bring transformation in our lives. He is supremely worthy of our trust and all of our delights and all of our worship. There is no one else like this God. I found that in the seasons of my life, where I was waiting the most, the greatest thing I could do is declare the truth about who God is right now in this moment. Because when you're waiting, you kind of go in and out of these seasons or these feelings or these thoughts of there's no way this is ever going to change. But when we declare who God is, and there's something powerful about speaking it, when we declare who God is, He shows up 
mightily. Let me close with this. Waiting worshipers are ready worshipers. There's this statement in the middle of the psalm that is just absolutely fascinating to me. And it, it really seems out of place. When you read it, you kind of instinctively know that it's not quite right. That there's no way that David could have fulfilled it. In fact, what we see in Hebrews chapter 10 is that the author of Hebrews in the Old Testament, several hundred years after this psalm is written, the author of Hebrews quotes this very psalm and says this, Therefore, when Christ Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus Christ himself fulfilled and satisfied the deepest longings and desire. He satisfied the waiting of the Jewish people for centuries. And when we come here today and we gather together, if we were to be really honest with the Lord and write down what we are waiting for today, we would see that there would be a variety of requests, a variety of things that we are waiting for, a, a variety of things that we are pleading with God, God, would you break through, would you make this happen in my life? But the reality is, is that when we gather together for worship, we are ultimately waiting for Jesus. And we never forget that this life is but for a moment. But for people who trust in Christ, for people who turn to Him in prayer, those who are transformed by Him, those who tell of His mighty deeds, those are the people who are ready for His return. You see, we're ultimately waiting for Jesus. All of these cravings, all of these longings, all of these desires that we come into worship with are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. May we be the people who trust in Him. Let us pray. Jesus, we pray that you would always be the hero of our times together. Lord, whether we're praying, whether we are testifying or witnessing to your goodness, whether we're preaching or whether we're sharing in the Lord's Supper, Father, we pray that you would be the hero of this time, that you would be the one who is exalted, for there is no one like you. God, we don't want to settle for just knowing about you. Lord, we want to know you. So would you open our hearts in this time as we trust in you. God, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we want to be very intentional about throwing off the sin that so easily entangles. We want to be very intentional about confessing the things that are not in line with who you are. Because God, we want to come to this time where we fellowship together with pure hearts. Hearts that seek to trust you, to turn to you, and to be transformed by you to tell of your mighty deeds. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>